In the first three videos of this series, we developed the phasor representation for resistors, inductors, and capacitors in AC circuits. But what happens when we combine all three, a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor, into one RLC series circuit? Well, it looks like the short answer is that we're generating waveform spaghetti over there on the right. But by the end of this video, I promise you'll understand the waveform spaghetti. So let's dive into the phasor analysis of the RLC series circuit. So there's our RLC series circuit with a sinusoidal voltage in series and a sinusoidal current I of T flowing through it. So the main goal of our analysis is to relate that net voltage of the power source to the current flowing in the circuit. And this is going to give us a handle on a couple important properties. First, we'll be able to write down an Ohm's law style relation between voltage amplitude and current amplitude. And that gives us the total effective resistance of the circuit, which we call impedance. Then we're going to write down the voltage function as a function of time in a way that allows us to see its phase shift with respect to the current function. So we start with the usual statement that the sinusoidal current function is given by I of t equals big I cosine omega t. And this is our standard reference phase for all the sinusoidal functions involved in this calculation. In other words, we've given the current function a phase angle of phi equals zero. And again, we follow the usual procedure here by applying KVL, or Kirchhoff's voltage law, so we traverse a closed loop around this circuit and keep track of the voltage changes. So we travel up the power source and down the resistor, inductor, and capacitor, and all those voltage changes sum to zero, so we can solve for little v of t, the power source voltage. And we get little v of t is equal to the sum of the voltage drops across all three of those circuit elements, and what we're looking at here on the right hand side is actually the sum of three sinusoidal functions that all have different phases. And these were worked out in the previous three videos and I'll just post links to those at the top as I go. First, we have the voltage across the resistor and that's just V sub R of T is equal to big I big R cosine omega T. So the voltage across the resistor is in phase with the current function. Second, we have the voltage across the inductor, and that's V sub L is equal to I X sub L, that's called the inductive reactance, times cosine omega T plus pi over two. So that's leading the phase of the current function by a quarter cycle or pi over two. And X sub L, that inductive reactance, that's a frequency dependent quantity given by omega times L. And that tells us the effective resistance of the inductor for a particular frequency. And third, we have the voltage across the capacitor, and that's V sub C is equal to I times X sub C, that's called capacitive reactance, times the cosine of omega T minus pi over two. So that's lagging the phase of the current function by pi over two. And that capacitive reactance is given by one over omega C. And again, that's a frequency dependent quantity, basically telling us the effective resistance of the capacitor. So I've used the term effective resistance for these individual circuit elements, but what we're going to discover by studying their phasors is that the capacitor and inductor can conspire with each other to actually reduce the total resistance of the circuit depending on the frequency we drive it at. So we sub all this stuff into our formula for little v of t. And at first glance, it looks like we're in trouble here. We have a sum of three phase shifted cosines to simplify. And that would be a huge challenge to accomplish using trig identities. But fortunately, there's a better way. And that's the phasor representation of these sinusoidal functions, which both simplifies the algebra and gives us deeper geometric insight into the interactions of sinusoidal functions. So the idea of a phasor is to represent a sinusoidal function with angular frequency omega as a vector rotating with angular frequency omega. So in our picture, we're looking at an arbitrary moment in time t, and we see the current phasor tilted at an angle of omega t. Remember, that has a phase angle of zero by convention. And the voltage phasor for the resistor, that's in phase with the current phasor, tilted at an angle of omega t and having a magnitude of ir. And there's our inductor voltage phasor with a magnitude of i x sub l, and that leads the resistor phasor by pi over two or 90 degrees. And finally, there's our capacitor phasor lagging by 90 degrees 
and having a magnitude of I X sub C. And the horizontal projections of these phasors are what actually gives us the values of the sinusoidal voltage functions at this moment in time. So there's the projection of the resistor phasor. The projection is IR times cosine omega t because we're just taking hypotenuse times the cosine to get that horizontal projection. So that's exactly the same thing as the voltage function we already wrote down for the resistor. And there's the horizontal projection for the inductor voltage phasor. Again, it's giving us exactly that sinusoidal function we already wrote down just by taking the horizontal projection of this thing. Note that its angle there was omega t plus pi over 2 because it's pi over 2 ahead of the resistor voltage phasor. And finally, we get the projection of our capacitor voltage phasor. And that gives us the right thing. It's I times xc cosine omega t minus pi over 2. But here's where we get a huge payoff to the phasor representation of these functions. Remember, our net voltage function, little v of t, is the sum of all the x components which give the individual sinusoidal voltages across each circuit element. But the sum of the x components of three vectors is exactly the same thing as the x component of the vector sum of those three vectors. And here's a quick proof if you're skeptical. So we're going to start our proof by just defining three two-dimensional vectors that we call u, v, and w. So I wrote those in i hat, j hat notation, where i hat is the unit vector in the x direction and j hat is the unit vector in the y direction. So now I can add these three vectors together. And there it is just in component form. I haven't done anything but sub in the definitions of those vectors. And now in the next step, we're going to gather the like terms. So I want all the i hat containing terms together, all the j hat containing terms together, and then we're going to factor out the i hat and the j hat. So the sum of those three vectors is given by the sum of the three x components multiplied by i hat plus the sum of the three y components multiplied by j hat. And what this means, looking at the coefficient of my i hat there, is that the x component of the vector sum is just given by ux plus vx plus wx. So again, what we are trying to prove here is the sum of x components of three vectors is the same thing as taking the vector sum of those three vectors and then taking the x component. And this is amazing news because finding the geometric vector sum of these three phasors turns out to be remarkably simple due to the 90 degree phase relationships between the vectors. So there's the hideous expression we're trying to simplify for little v. And all we have to do to simplify this thing is vector add these three phasors for the resistor, inductor, and capacitor, and then take the x component of the vector sum. So we're going to start the vector addition by combining the capacitor and inductor phasors. Those point in opposite directions, so if we pick up the capacitor phasor and attach it to the head of the inductor phasor, the resulting vector sum, and just a quick reminder here, that points from the tail of the first vector to the head of the second, that's going to have a magnitude equal to IXL minus IXC, where the order of that difference is purely because I happen to draw IXL longer than IXC, so in cases where the capacitive reactance is larger than the inductive reactance, this vector will actually point in the opposite direction, but that doesn't change anything about our mathematical conclusions. So now we're going to vector add this resultant IXL minus IXC vector to the voltage phasor for the resistor. And again, that's just head to tail vector addition. And what makes this addition so nice is that these two components are automatically at right angles, and that's because our phase differences were both 90 degrees. So getting the vector sum in polar form is a matter of applying the Pythagorean theorem and the inverse tangent function. And there's the vector sum, and we write the magnitude of that as a big V. And notice it's making an angle of phi with respect to our reference direction, which is an angle of omega t, in other words, a phase angle of zero in alignment with the resistance voltage phasor. So again, we're relieved to be looking at a right triangle here. This just simplifies the math so much. And we're going to go ahead and write down the magnitude of that net voltage vector. And that just requires the Pythagorean theorem. So there's V. It's just the square root of the sum of the squares of those two legs of the right triangle. So the square root of IR all squared plus the quantity IXL minus IXC all squared. Now the natural thing to do here is pull a factor of i out of the interior of that square root. And this gives us an Ohm's Law style relationship. 
what we're seeing is that voltage is proportional to the current, just like Ohm's law. But this time, the square root term there is playing the role of resistance. And that term gets a special name. So that's called the total impedance of the circuit. We usually notate that with a capital Z. So Z is equal to the square root of R squared plus the quantity XL minus XC all squared. Now that impedance is a measure of the total effective resistance of the circuit. And note that the effective resistance is frequency dependent here because the capacitive and inductive reactances depend on omega. That means the current amplitude will change depending on the frequency we use to drive the circuit. And that's a topic we explore in more detail in the next video. But what I do want to point out for now is that it's at least conceivable that you could pick a special frequency omega so that XL and XC have the same magnitude. And that's what I mean by those two reactances conspiring with each other to reduce the overall effective resistance. So note now that we can also write down our voltage amplitude in terms of the impedance. So we're just looking at this Ohm's law-like relationship here and replacing the square root with a Z. So the net voltage amplitude for this circuit is I times Z. So there's that, and we'll throw it into this diagram as well. Now, as for the phase angle phi, the angle between our reference direction and the direction of the net voltage phasor, that's just given by an inverse tangent function. Phi is the angle whose tangent is IXL minus IXC. In other words, the opposite side of that triangle divided by IR, the adjacent side, and then the I's cancel out. So we arrive at this formula for the phase angle, just inverse tangent XL minus XC divided by R. Now remember the current phasor points in the same direction as the resistance phasor. So the phase angle between the total current and the total voltage at the power source depends on the frequency we use to drive the circuit. And again, that frequency dependence is hiding in the inductive reactants and capacitive reactants in that formula. So note that if the capacitive reactance happens to be larger than the inductive reactance, we're going to cross over the resistor phasor and have a total voltage phasor that lags the current instead of leading it. The inverse tangent takes care of this by producing a minus sign when that numerator becomes negative. So everything is working beautifully here. So to bring it all home, now we can take the X component of the vector sum. So we just take that hypotenuse V and multiply it by the cosine of omega T plus phi. That's the total angle relative to the horizontal axis there. And now in our final formula, I've replaced the big V with I times Z, where Z is the impedance. So we started out trying to simplify this little V at the top. And that's the voltage of the power source or the total voltage across the RLC combination. That's a function that began as a sum of three phase shifted cosines. And using phasors, we managed to boil this down to a single phase shifted cosine function, IZ cosine omega T plus phi, where Z is the total impedance given by the square root of R squared plus XL minus XC quantity squared. And phi is the phase angle given by an inverse tangent of XL minus XC over R. So now it's time to deliver on my promise that you would understand the spaghetti in the intro animation. In our animation, we see the rotating phasor diagram with each circuit element represented there and the inductor leading by pi over two, the capacitor lagging by pi over two, and the total voltage phasor leading with a phase angle of phi. On the right, we're plotting the sinusoidal functions generated from those phasors by taking their horizontal projections. And there's the total voltage phasor in bold white given by IZ cosine omega t plus phi. In the next video, we take a closer look at the frequency dependence of impedance. We find the special driving frequency at which the current amplitude is maximized, and that's called the resonant frequency for the circuit. And we're going to follow that up by looking at the power delivered to the circuit as a function of frequency as well. And what we'll find is that the power delivery is maximized at the resonant frequency. I'll post a link to that video at the upper left, and I'll see you there.